My name is Ethan Phillips. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm a health policy management major from Fairfax, Virginia. And fun fact about me, I compete on the UNC sailing team. Yeah, I think for me this question is largely about experience, but um, also needs to take into account vision. So from the experience side, I have the most student government experience, but more importantly to me, the most community building and advocacy experience. Um, I've been doing mental health advocacy work for eight and a half years, sexual violence prevention work for five years, and using the, the experience I've built up through building coalitions, engaging diverse stakeholder groups, I feel that I have the best experience to be able to represent a, what is a very diverse student body and the diverse interests, perspectives, and needs of all of those students. From a vision perspective, I think I, I cannot take credit for the vision that my campaign has created. Um, it's never about me. It never has been about me. And I've been saying that since day one of the campaign. It's always about students. And because of that, I've been really intentional about trying to build a campaign and a team that can represent as many perspectives as possible and bring together the most ideas, which to me always produces the best ideas. So I think the vision that we have for not just me or, or not just my ideas, but the ideas we've collected by talking with students across the entire campus, across designations of undergrad, grad, professional, um, is the vision that Carolina needs to build better together. This is a problem I've thought a lot about, particularly because um, I am a white, cisgendered, straight male and do not represent the identities of our diverse student body perfectly. Um, I look like a lot of other people that I've worked with in student government for the last three years. Um, but how I don't look like a lot of the people that I work with outside of student government in mental health spaces, in sexual violence prevention, in campus safety, which are issues that particularly affect marginalized communities around campus, especially our LGBTQ populations and our marginalized um, race and culture groups across campus. So I've having that interaction, I think that I've come to a better understanding and appreciation for the fact that um, like I said before, this is not something I can do alone. Um, this isn't something that I would ever intend to do alone. So it starts with a student body president that is willing and, and able to bring on a team that can represent a lot of those voices um, better than I can. So I'm committed to um, putting a person of color, I would hope a woman of color in the position of vice president. Um, that's something that not just taking that as a play out of Joe Biden's book, but something I really care about. Um, something I think is needed in order to make sure that the advocacy spaces that that person in particular is involved in, such as the student advisory committed to the chancellor, um, has voices in it that represent our campus better than I can individually. I'm also committed to bringing that same equity into the rest of the positions, particularly by not making it a one person um, job of selection. I want to bring in people from the very beginning that can help me select a team um, that doesn't look like me and that looks like people that are on our campus every day and, and experience perspectives, challenges, burdens um, that I might not have the best insight into. So it starts with building a core team of diverse populations, people who have lived experience. Um, and then it, it's about continuing the conversation beyond that. So through my work with the Community Empowerment Fund, um, I've had a front row seat as an advocate working with marginalized populations in Chapel Hill, um, our individuals experiencing homelessness, food insecurity, job insecurity. And from that, I've, I've been able to take away so much about trying to continue the conversation um, beyond just one space or beyond just filling positions. It's not just about diversity to me, it's about inclusion and it's about equity, which only can happen through allowing those folks to have their own voice continually. Yeah, this is a part of my platform I'm really excited about. Um, one of the things I talk about in the last section of my platform about um, student government reform is how I've seen student government uh, be somewhat of a gatekeeper to the administration of the last three years. I think it's hard for individual students who have concerns to bring them up to administrators to voice those concerns, to have their opinions and, and perspectives heard without going through student government. And I want to end that. Um, that student government gatekeeping process. I want to make sure there's more spaces available for any student at any time to be able to have those conversations um, directly to administrators. So I've worked into my platform that we would have regular town halls with administrators that can be requested by any student 
um, for a particular issue or a particular administrator they want to talk to. And that's the first way is just having these conversations regularly, repeatedly, and transparently so that any student that wants to have their concern heard can do that without needing student government to be their microphone. Um, the other thing is, is making student government a better microphone. And I use that analogy um, because it, it really is not about taking in information and putting it out. It's about amplifying. Uh, it's about making sure that students can be heard and then their voice is the one being louder. So I really, really think that this involves the um, external appointments process. External appointments in the years past have typically been a rollover that uh, the student that gets in it as a freshman gets to keep that position year after year and it becomes the same voices in the same rooms. Um, I want to make sure that can be ended by requiring every student to reapply, first of all, and second, um, making sure that we are prioritizing uh, students and communities who have not typically held those seats. Um, so bringing in an entire board of people, like I said in the, in the previous question, who can make those selections equitably um, and include voices that have not been included in the past. And then making that application process rolling so that student, not just first years who might be overwhelmed with the process coming in and just wanna get their foot on the ground here at Carolina, but you know, if they come back six months later and say that they're ready to get involved, they wanna have their voice heard, that there are still positions open for them. Um, currently, we have, a very low rate of filling these external appointments and I think making it a rolling process can not only make sure that other students who typically wouldn't have access to those positions can fill them but also that we just fill more of them so we have more student voices um, from across our campus getting to voice their opinions and perspectives to the administration. Awesome. Um. Yeah accessibility is something that um, I care a lot about so as a short aside in high school I um, worked as a, a swim instructor for adapted aquatics programs which worked with students with physical mental learning disabilities um, to help them you know learn how to swim and so in, through those experiences I've gained a lot of perspective but I think the most important thing I've learned is that um, we need more students with with disabilities and, and with accessibility needs to be given the space to have their own voice heard. Um, so that's why in my platform, the number one item in my accessibility section is about um, creating this task force that will at the end of a, um, the year produce a formal set of recommendations and then stay on as a guiding body for the administration to implement those recommendations. The biggest thing I think we need to recognize is the university just doesn't know where our biggest accessibility needs are yet. Um, we don't have a good grasp on where students are experiencing these burdens and these difficulties. So having these this group of engaged students, not only from student government, but from uh, disability advocate organizations, from graduate and professional um, communities to talk to really understand what are their needs. The second points I want to make here is that learning accessibility is something I care a lot about. It's what I did in the mental health committee my sophomore year at Carolina, um, was working with our Center for Professional Excellence or Faculty Excellence and our ARS services um, to try to find where we could adapt virtual learning opportunities to better meet student needs. And I want to continue that since one, we know that the pandemic is not over and um, it's going to continue to affect our lives for semesters to come. But two, because I think there are things we can benefit from learning about virtual um, uh, engagement that we just haven't taken advantage of yet. So recording all lectures, um, hybrid attendance for every class and every day, um, transcripts published of the, the lectures so that students can go back and review the material in a different format. Um, I think those are all things that are such common sense about meeting these accessibility needs for learning environments that we just need to universally implement across the board. Yeah, this is a big one for me. So like I said, I've been doing mental health advocacy for eight and a half years. Um, this is what got me into student government when I was in high school. It's why I continued in college. It's what I wake up every morning and think about is how can we be doing better. So I have a lot in my platform about it. Um, but the, the key things I want to recognize that we're doing well is that I think a lot of people care about it. There are some issues on campus where the biggest part of it, the biggest hurdle, is just getting more people to understand it and um, voice their opinions about it and have perspectives heard. Mental health is something that clearly our student body cares a lot about and people are willing to have their voices heard. Um, I've seen that this year in refounding the Mental Health Coalition um, and I think it's our greatest strength is that we have students that care, we have faculty that care, um, and we have administrators that wish they could be doing a little bit more but need some additional help from our students to make sure that happens. So 
Some of the big initiatives I have in my platform, relevant to CAPS, um, our CAPS counselors and therapists are burnt out. Um, we don't have enough of them. Their caseload for students is too high. So one of the big things I've, I've put in there is reducing the number of the student to therapist ratio to be a thousand to one. Currently it's around 1200 or 1300 to one. And um, just reducing that by a little bit can make sure that these counselors not only have the space to really be there for their students and take care of their own mental wellness, but then also do more outreach programming, provide more resources for students that aren't just therapy and counseling. The other big part that I'm, I'm really proud of in my platform is peer support. Um, this is something that we've seen become more relevant on campus over the last year through organizations like Peer to Peer, and I've had incredible experiences working with groups like that. But we've also brought in a good amount of funding from the system office just in the last couple months that can go towards peer support programming. And I think we need to take advantage of that as soon as possible to make sure that not only undergrads and specific to different identity groups and majors and um, academic pursuits have their peers that they can connect with around similar interests and experiences, but the graduate and professional students can build more of a community through these peer support networks. And lastly um, is building a central resource hub for mental health. This is something that I've heard repeatedly from students, not only on the campaign trail, um, but for years, is it's just hard to access and know what the policies are um, around what our mental health resources are. So building a central resource website where students can go and triage whatever experience they might be having to understand what are the best resources for them. How can they be connected with someone that understands their needs, that understands their struggle, their community, their identity, um, and give them just a better front door to all of those resources. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I talked about a little bit um, in creating this, this team, in valuing not only diversity in my board, but inclusion, and trying to receive open and feedback from uh, the folks I bring on and the folks that are leaving as well to say, I've heard from many students that I work with in student government that are um, not quite happy with the way they've been included or the voices that, or the way their voices have been heard, particularly from students of color. And I wanna make sure that we are listening to what those concerns are, not just waving folks out the door when they choose to leave. Um, so starting with that, listening and learning and building a team that I can rely on who can represent students that don't just look like me. The, in terms of the work that I want to see student government do around DEI, um, this year the Richards administration created our new uh, uh, directorship or department for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I want to see that expanded. I want to see an individual who has experience or passion in DEI work embedded in each of the other departments so that every project that student government um, starts can also start with a conversation about how do we need to be thinking about DEI? What are the equity implications of this new policy we're advocating for? So that it isn't just happening in its own silo, but that this work about DEI is being spread throughout. Um, so I've spent the last year and a half working for the Center for, or the UNC Center for Health Equity Research. Um, and the biggest takeaway I have there is being able to connect with these communities directly, transparently, um, early on and continuously is how we make sure that equity is, is actually embedded, not just something that we talk about or aspire to. Um, I really think equity is not a place we reach, but a, a journey that we have to all be on at all times. Um, it has to be embedded into everything we do. And the way we do that is continue to talk with folks. Um, continue these conversations, especially the Campus Presidents Council that represents, uh, that has presidents and, and groups represented there from almost all of the major um, identity groups on campus and their clubs and organizations. I think the first thing for me is expanding it so that more voices are heard in that group. And then I have in my platform that I want to see those positions stipended um, so that we're valuing the, the work that these people are doing and not just leaning on our, our students of color to do all this work for us, but actually valuing their voices and, and giving them confidence compensation for it. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> like I said before, I, I don't see COVID going away anytime soon, at least the effects that it's having on us. Even if students are not getting sick in huge amounts or that we haven't had any hospitalizations, that doesn't mean people aren't being affected. Um, one of the biggest ways I think is in social connectedness and mental health. That is going to continue to be an effect um, that we see on students, especially students coming in from high school where they haven't had uh, the same high school experiences that I might have had in an un-COVID affected set of years there. Um, 
and being able to really form deep connections to Carolina's campus early on. That's important and it really starts day one from orientation. Um, how we connect those groups together, how we make those conversations happen long term. So it's not just a weekend that you spend here, but it's a group of people you can lean on for four years. And mental health, I talked about all the resources I wanna to bring to campus and the peer connectedness. Um, I think COVID has also changed the dynamic between uh, students and their faculty in terms of connectedness and mental health. Um, students are overwhelmingly keep saying that there is burnout and we're, we're feeling overwhelmed by the academic uh, pressures and expectations. As, we, as the university starts to transition out of COVID, get rid of the policies that were implemented like universal pass fail options um, that allowed students a little more flexibility and, and room to breathe in, inside of COVID. As the university gets rid of those policies, students are being left behind. Yeah. Um, and the relationship the students have with their faculty and with their academics are being left behind. So a big part of my platform also around mental health is um, training all of our faculty in mental health first aid so that they have a better understanding of not only how to recognize signs of mental illness and, and mental distress, but also can be better advocates for students and connect with students better. Around academics, and this is my platform section specific to COVID-19, um, I am a huge fan of hybrid classes. I think they give us so much flexibility for the students that, over, that you know, the, the large portion of students that feel ready to go back to classes, that want to be here in person. Um, it gives that option. And then for the students, for whatever reason, whether it's isolation, quarantine, just don't feel comfortable yet. Um, or who have underlying conditions and might need to stay home, or who feel they learn in a better in a virtual environment. Hybrid classes give them just the same options to succeed as, as students who are ready to come back in person. So infusing that into our academics and then learning from that in our other spaces. Um, so I've been holding all of my department meetings inside of student government this year, hybrid. Um, it's worked great for us. We can be in a classroom, we can have people there contributing to the discussion in person, and then we can have a, a whiteboard up with the Zoom room there so that those folks can be included too. And that kind of inclusion work, that accessibility, um, it's central to preventing COVID infection. It allows us to have better quarantine and isolation, but it also allows students to feel more comfortable and, and um, have a handle on their academic experience. Some of the other policies I wanna implement around COVID is bringing back um, that pass fail system I mentioned, giving students more flexibility. It makes no sense that we think COVID isn't affecting academics anymore in, in a way that doesn't mean we need greater flexibility. So bringing that back, bringing back uh, quarantine and isolation dorms. Um, I launched a, as part of my campaign, um, a program to visit every single dorm in two weeks and we succeeded. And in doing that, I talked with so many students that live residentially who are really concerned about their sweet mate or the person in the room next to them who just tested positive um, and they don't have anywhere to go. Either them to, to quarantine or if you know, they just don't feel comfortable with someone else living in the same space as them while infected. So bringing back quarantine and isolation dorms so that students have a place to go. Um, and then bringing back meal delivery service for all students in quarantine and isolation um, so that students who still need to eat, still need to take care of their wellness and their bodies um, can do that even while they're quarantining. This is an issue. Um, that I care a lot about, that I've done a lot of work in, not just this year in, in student government, but over the last few years. Um, it's a personal issue for many. Um, it's something that likely being here at Carolina, we all know somebody, whether we know it or not, who has experienced sexual or gender-based violence in some way. Um, this is important for the university to prioritize. So the key policy items that I wanna highlight about this, um, I think we too often rely on our, on our administration to understand student needs perfectly. Um, and that is to our detriment sometimes. So I think the first thing is reforming our trainings for bystander intervention and consent training. Um, every student should be required to not just click through a few slides on what consent is and how to recognize dangerous incidents involving um, c compromising situations or um, the alcohol-based training talks about it a little bit, but these aren't ways that people actually have conversations. They aren't um, relevant to actual student experiences a lot of the time. So I, I wanna make sure we can bring um, a personal element to it. Um, we are bringing on new violence prevention coordinators. We've hired new gender violence service coordinators, and those positions are gonna allow us to actually um, 
put out trainings that can be taught in person or virtually, but live to students where students can ask questions. Um, students can walk through actual scenarios, what it would look like to intervene in a situation where you're a bystander. Um, understand more deeply what consent means, not just when you have to say yes or no, but um, actually what it means to give someone the respect um, that consent is all about. So reforming those trainings, delivering them live, allowing live conversations and questions to happen that allow for better growth around these issues. And then accountability. Um, it is no secret at Carolina that uh, too many survivors of sexual and gender-based violence choose to never come forward because of the burdens that are inherent to the process related to involving the police in, um, in getting accountability. So one of the ideas that I've heard um, in talking with survivors is to bring a more restorative justice process um, to the table, infuse more trauma-based care. So this is a, a potential partnership I've included in the platform between CAPS and our Equal Opportunity and Compliance Office and our Gender Violence Service Coordinators to make sure that students that come forward um, with incidents of sexual or gender-based violence have direct, immediate access to trauma-informed mental health care um, that can start even before the, the process of accountability starts. Um, sometimes it's important to heal before we can um, move on to accountability. So starting with that, starting with the mental health and trauma-based care aspect of it. And then restorative justice is a much deeper and human process a lot of the time than involving the police is. Um, many students choose to involve the, the police in, in their accountability process, in their personal journey of um, their survivorship, but many do not. And we need to be able to have accountability options for those students that feel that involving the police isn't the right option for them um, so that they aren't just left out to dry but given some access to trauma-informed restorative justice programming um, that can heal our campus because this isn't an individual issue um, although there are individual in incidents this is a campus issue everyone should care about this and i think everyone does care about this um, we just need to have better processes set up so that students can um, get involved and be part of the solution Awesome. Yeah, so through my current role, I've, I've had an interesting insight into the UNCPD. It wasn't something that I thought I would ever get directly involved with coming into student government from a mental health perspective, but it's been really insightful. Um, our campus police system, like our administration, needs more student input. Um, they need to have student voices there to tell them when they're doing things wrong and when they need to change policies and practices. So that's why in my platform I've uh, included a, a point about forming a new UNC Police Advisory Committee. Um, this is something that I've talked to the UNCPD about in the past that they're open to, but it's a long-term process. It's something we need to work out with many different stakeholder groups and that same coalition mindset that I talked about earlier. So that's the first thing, is just bring more student voice to the table through an advisory board for the UNCPD. In terms of the role that I see UNCPD having, I want to see them as part of the solution for wellness rather than part of the problem for safety. Um, so this conversation about involving them in wellness uh, has to recognize that UNCPD is who responds to almost all of the wellness checks on campus. Um, it makes no sense to me that we send largely untrained, armed, individuals to go deal with students that are in mental health crisis. Um, so making sure that we can learn from what Chapel Hill PD already has and uh, hire new counselors and therapists and social workers who can respond to those incidents of, of wellness need instead um, and removing the the armament part of it. So um, sending unarmed officers with those social workers who can facilitate the actual process and the logistics of it, um, but step back and let the, the professionals in mental health take care of the rest. Um, in, term, in, in terms of role on safety, um, we are an open campus. We're part of a larger community and we have to realize that it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a, a UNC PD that is on campus and um, not care about the overall community that we're affecting and that we're a part of. Um, so. Part of this advisory board, I wanna make sure we're involving folks from Chapel Hill, um, folks from the Chapel Hill community, and um, also other, other groups on campus that have a larger role to play in the conversation with police interactions. So particularly people of color, students of color, who can bring their perspectives. We know that South Campus is over-policed. Um, it is disproportionately affected by 
uh, police presence than other parts of campus, particularly uh, off-campus communities who are not under that jurisdiction. So we need to have more input from students about what does safety look like? What does it feel like? Um, and we need to champion student-based causes around safety. So safe walk and safe ride is a big part of my platform that I want to make sure um, we're honoring these student groups and these student contributions to our campus safety that a lot of the time um, circumvent the need for a police department or for police presence. Um, if we can have students available to drive students around campus and walk students from place to place, then we don't always need to worry about where the police officers are and whether they're available to help if an incident was to happen. Yeah, it, this, uh, this type of question about achievability always reminds me of in high school, it took me three years to form a, a mental health coalition and we were successful and it's still going to this day, but I also realized that like one year as a student body president is probably not enough to do everything that I would love to do. So for me, it's about building a, um, building upon a foundation that we can work off of. I, I've been really proud of the work that the Richards administration has done to reform student government structure, to be able to set these foundations and start these projects that are really long-term efforts. Um, for example, our, our police involvement that I just spoke about, that advisory committee didn't happen this year, and I don't think it's gonna happen in the next two months of this administration, but it can happen in another year or in a year after that. And being able to have these conversations, not about what am I gonna do, what is student government gonna do in a Phillips administration, but being able to, to look longer term. So the first thing I wanna do is not build projects that are on only a one year timeline. I think that limits our success when we say, this initiative or this program needs to happen within this year. Um, because then when it doesn't happen, we fail. But when we build a timeline that takes two years or three years, we have a lot more achievable goals, we can reach higher, and I think we can achieve more. So that also means not wiping the slate clean when I come in. Um, so really taking time to learn from what is happening in student government, other parts I'm not aware of right now. Um, how can we build connections with our graduate and professional student government who can help us in this work and be partners um, so that it's not on undergraduate student government's shoulders all the time. And then working with these clubs and organizations that are student run, that have been here longer than a year, um, that are doing this work already. I think back to divestment, which uh, divestment from fossil fuels, which is something that other student organizations have been championing for years. And the student government really has only picked up in the last year or so. Um, so being able to recognize where this work happens outside of student government and champion their voices, their causes, um, and recognize it doesn't have to all be about us. It doesn't have to be student government's job to do everything. Sometimes it can be our job to assist and, and make things a little easier and open up conversations, um, but recognize that we are limited. The, the other thing that I'll say about this is um, I want to see student government transition away from a model where we think we have to do everything without the administration. Um, I think that while administration continues to fail us continually on so many issues, um, they're also the ones that can hold things for much longer than we can. Yeah, I think I touched on it briefly, but it's, it's worth, to me at least, <laughs> bringing it a little bit more forefront is um, I think student government has a lot of potential in terms of being a better advocate for students by partnering with student groups who are already doing the work. Um, I think too often student government gets caught in making itself important um, when it's not about student government, just like how I am passionate about the fact that my campaign is not about me. I don't believe student government is about student government. I think it's always about students or it always should be about students. And the more that we can include student voices student opinions and the work that students might already be doing um, into our advocacy efforts, into our support, the stronger we can be as a student government, as a student body, um, and as a, as a campus. The other thing I'll say um, is more related to the, the vision that I have overall, um, that it really is about giving students an opportunity to thrive. Um, so wellness is the term that I use for that a lot, um, but it's really about creating an environment in which students can learn most effectively, can live in a way that supports their goals and ambitions and desire for what they want Carolina to be to them. 
Um, and building that campus, building that Carolina that works better for students, that supports students' needs, and that listens to student voices um, is really what I, I think we can accomplish within the next year. It's not a one-year project. It's not a, there's no deadline. There's no final end goal. It's a process that we need to always be thinking about. We always need to be working on. Um, but I think it's one that we can build stronger uh, through, through collaboration, through coalitions, through open and transparent dialogue. And that takes student involvement. Um, I don't want to pretend that I can do this all alone. I don't want to pretend that even my campaign or a student government organization can do this alone. It takes everybody, and it takes everybody's voices, opinions, perspectives. Um, so even if this is not about voting for me or it's not about, um, you know, getting involved in student government directly through a position or an external appointment. It's about making your voice heard and finding opportunities to do that and being part of a Carolina that works better for everybody. So I truly, I truly believe, it may be overly optimistic, but I really believe that we can create a Carolina that works better for everyone, um, but we can only do it if we're working together. My zodiac sign, I'm a Gemini. <laughs> I'm sorry if that's a red flag. No, but. That's no all we're basing the. <laughs> Everything else didn't matter. Awesome. Thank you.